Hey, Las Vegas, it's Booze Week here at CityCast Las Vegas. But a lot of you are celebrating January by saying no to alcohol, aka dryuary. So how do you stay sober in Las Vegas? Today on CityCast Las Vegas, I'm talking with a guest who started a blog for anyone who wants to be sober in Vegas. She'll give us all the tips on where to go, what to order, and how to maintain a sober lifestyle in our city. It's Thursday, January 19th, 2023. I'm Vogue Robinson, and this is CityCast Las Vegas. Hi, Kim Miller. Welcome (laughs) to CityCast Las Vegas. Hi, Vogue. It's so good to see you. You too. I'm a happy camper now. I was like, oh, a reason to talk to Kim. (laughs) So, you know, booze is everywhere in this town. And I know you have a blog called Sober in Vegas. And it makes me want to ask you the question, like, is it hard to be sober in Vegas? I think that would depend on, you know, your personal journey. I think that's different for everybody. I get people that reach out to me and they're just maybe taking a little bit of time off from drinking and they're visiting Vegas for all of the reasons people visit Vegas. Um, (laughs) And then I also hear from folks that are locals here and maybe looking to kind of experiment with not drinking. So I think that Las Vegas has so much to offer that, I mean, the city is good at being whatever it needs to be to Hmm. whoever, (laughs) whoever needs it. So (laughs) So if you're looking for things that are outside of drinking and there's a lot of options for you here. So for you personally, what are some of the challenges you faced while, you know, embarking on your sober journey in Vegas? So it's interesting. My sober and sobriety journey began actually when I was still living in Chicago. I'm from Vegas, but I'd moved away for a number of years. And at the time I was living in Chicago And I tried for a number of years to just kind of have a dry month with not a lot of success. And it wasn't until I think December 2014 that I had a successful dry month. And during that time, I was in Chicago winter, (laughs) famously beautiful. And I was coming home, I believe, this is kind of nuts. I think it was actually over MLK Day weekend. I was coming home to do a visit to my family And the night I got back to Chicago, um, my old boss called me into his office and said, you're going to get laid off this week. I just want you to know. And I thought, oh, oh, man, I don't know if I can curse on this podcast, so I'll be thoughtful about that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I kind of saw two roads ahead of me. Um, One road was that this is where I go back to drinking and sort of really just drink away the heartbreak of losing this job that I loved so deeply. Or I could continue on the path that I'd started a couple weeks ago and use this as more sort of fodder to restart my life. So at that moment, I, you know, I went home that night and I told my partner, I said to him, I think we're going to move home to Vegas. And he was like, what are you talking about? You have your dream job. And I said, yeah, I don't anymore. (laughs) Um, So, you know, at that point, I decided that I would continue on with my sobriety journey because I was about to undergo some huge life transitions. In my next year of sort of making that transition from Chicago back to Vegas, I had a career transition. My husband and I you know, we're saving up to buy a house. We just were making a lot of life changes. And I decided during that year, I'm like, I think I'm really done. And then so yeah, in December 2016, about two years after my first sober month, I started the Sober in Vegas blog, because it's really hard to make friends as an adult. Hmm. (laughs) And then layer on top of that being a person that like, doesn't really go out to bars. It is almost impossible. (laughs) Say, oh, yeah, it's me at the, oh, no, I don't want to meet you at the bar, actually. Can we uh, uh, golf? (laughs) Right? Like, it's it's really hard to, like, already it's awkward to make friends as an adult. Like, what do you say to someone that you think is cool? Like, do you want to be my friend? And then, like I said, put on top of it, sort of not having that social layer 
that can sort of loosen you up. It's just really hard. So yeah, starting the blog was sort of a way to find community. And it was a kind of like a last ditch effort to be like, I bet my people are out there. I I don't really know where, but this is one way I can find them. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, you and I, I know we met just because I started having a presence on Instagram and sort of, I loved that you were hosting so many events that didn't revolve around alcohol. So yeah, that's kind of, kind of my story and my timeline. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a good, important piece. Can you tell us about your relationship with alcohol before sobriety? Yeah, I've worked in creative fields all of my professional career. And there's a lot of drinking. That's where a lot of community happens is at the bar. I worked in theater for many years. Um, so there's always a the bar. Late <laughs> the late nights. The late nights. And there's usually a bar inside of the venue too. So it just was really baked into to my life. And I, I had some moments, you know, where something felt off. And at the time, there just wasn't a lot of language around it. Like in the past seven or eight years, our culture has become so much more open about mental health and anxiety about, you know, emotional health, about boundaries. And none of that language really existed in the way that it does today. And looking back, I think I was using alcohol to sort of um, not deal with some of some of those issues of mental health, of depression, of not being good at setting my own emotional and mental boundaries and creative boundaries, professional boundaries. Mm. So I was sort of using that as a way to avoid (laughs) the hard work of like, um, of creating a life that was a little bit healthier for me. So yeah, my relationship with alcohol was, it was a tool for me to not have to deal with those things. And over the past seven or eight years, I've found much better tools (laughs) Mm. to deal with, with mental health and, and the like. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. That's so good. How has your life in Vegas changed since you started living alcohol free? You know, um, gosh, so I, you know, I do a lot of writing now. I'm a visual artist myself. I also work professionally, you know, in the education sphere with um, fine arts. In addition to that, you know, I became a parent, which (laughs) the sobriety journey was awesome because you have to sort of I, I'm trying to think of the right words to describe it. Your identity really changes during sobriety, especially if you're a person that really sort of identified with with alcohol as being part of your community. So when I became a parent, you know, that was very, very hard. That's a big transition for anyone. I'm also an older parent, like I'm in my late 30s. <laughs> so um, sobriety kind of prepared me for that transition into becoming a parent as well. But yeah, I've found a great community out here. I feel um, really honored that I get to talk to people kind of about my journey in that. And in this time, I've also talked to a lot of people who have found their own sobriety journeys or sort of experimented with their relationship with alcohol to kind of figure out how they want that to be in their lives. And I'm, I'm really grateful. I think the Vegas community is one of the most open communities around and that there's there's a place for everybody if you're hmm. willing to to do the work and find your people. Yes, you have to definitely seek your people out. <laughs> like they are not coming to you, but if you shoot up the flare gun, they'll come. Yes. <laughs> so what are some of the ways the community has responded to your blog? You know, you'd be surprised. There are actually a fair amount of, of sober people living here in Las Vegas. I know that sounds so like, the antithesis of how Vegas markets itself, For which sure. is fine. But there's a there's a pretty good sober community here. And I would say there's a lot of like non-traditional sober folks here as well. I personally like came to sobriety in a non-traditional way. I didn't do any kind of program or AA or anything, but I do have, you know, friends who have gone through those programs and found success. Um, but in Vegas, I think there's like a whole spectrum of different people that have um you know, varying degrees of sobriety. Can you tell us some of the stories? You know, I get people reaching out to me for a lot of different reasons. I've had 
you know, I've had people before where they're coming maybe with their spouse and they know that their spouse doesn't drink and they want to be supportive to that Aww. person and say, hey, I want to do some research ahead of time. I'd like to make reservations at places that I know will be kind and considerate to my spouse who maybe doesn't drink or my partner or even my friend. You know, I've had folks reach out and say, I'm coming with a group of friends. You know, we're having a bachelorette party. I want to be thoughtful about there may be some people in our group that aren't drinking. Like, what would you recommend? So, yeah, I, I get people reaching out for a lot of different reasons that are coming through town and just asking for ways that they can be thoughtful to the other people that they're traveling with, as well as folks that maybe are coming through town and are newly sober or sort of nervous about how to navigate Las Vegas without alcohol. I might not be able to respond to everybody, but I do try and get back to folks if they reach out to me with sort of really specific questions. Hey, Las Vegas. I have a question for you. Have you thought about advertising on CityCast Las Vegas? If there's anything we've learned about making the show, it's that we reach Las Vegas' movers and shakers, the locals that are the most engaged in our community, first to try new restaurants and stay showing up to cultural events. We've even got some aspiring Vegas residents. So if you have a business, an event, a cause, or an organization that you want to make sure folks in Vegas know about, you should advertise on the CityCast Las Vegas podcast and newsletter. Put your message right into the ears of Las Vegas' most passionate audience who want to know more, just like you. Find out more by emailing us at ads at citycast.fm or checking our website, lasvegas.citycast.fm forward slash advertise. It's January, aka dryuary for a lot of folks. How do you feel about seeing this sober curious like movement take hold? Do you think it's just a trend? I mean, I don't think it's any more a trend than any of the other like sort of mental health awareness things that are happening in our culture right now. You know, when folks reach out to me and, and it's their kind of first time tackling it, I always like to ask them, you know, why are you doing this? And, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have to answer that to me, but just for themselves to be really honest with yourself about like, why are you doing this? Why do you want to explore your relationship with alcohol? You know, is it just that you kind of quote unquote want to see if you can do it? Or are you sort of curious how to fill that time? You know, are you doing it for health reasons? Like what are the reasons that you're doing it? So that's kind of one of the first things I say to people when they reach out and they're maybe doing like a dry January or a sober October. Um, I also always recommend that they kind of have a game plan of how they're going to fill that time. Hmm. Um, believe it or not, <laughs> sometimes like drinking and sort of the culture around drinking, whether that's like being at a bar, being at a party, going to a friend's house and drinking, like that does fill time. So be thoughtful about how you might fill that time. Like if you're taking something, you know, removing something from your life, what are you going to fill it back up with? Um, whether that's like a new habit or a new hobby, something new that you want to do to sort of replace that. Mm -hmm. um, I also kind of recommend that if folks are comfortable, that they sort of let their family and friends, their community know that this is something that they're going to be doing for a period of time, just so that it, there's not like a big, awkward surprise conversation. And that they can also support you. People come out of the woodworks with support. So it just, it feels a lot better. It feels way less lonely and it feels, it sort of removes that shame element, right? Mm, yeah. And it's so, so good that you mentioned that because I wanted to talk to you about, you know, I think people should have the right to choose when and to whom they disclose th this information, you know, that they're sober. For example, like if I'm out with coworkers or maybe it's none of my coworkers business that I'm sober. And so in that case, or, you know, maybe you need to not disclose that information to them for personal reasons. <laughs> but in that case, where would you recommend somebody can go and discreetly order their alcohol free, but like still fancy drink? I always say, consider your location. If you're at the double down, you're going to get something really different available to you. <laughs> <laughs> then if you're, you know, downtown at Rebar and like Rebar is like, has so many different so sober friendly options, 
or somewhere like the underground at the Mob Museum has like a whole mocktail menu, right? Okay. And if you don't see something that's available, like easy to see on the menu, you can always walk up to the bar on your own and just ask them, hey, would you mind putting a tonic water with a lime in a regular cup for me? Mm. And then your colleagues, friends, family, whomever, if you're not ready to have that conversation yet or don't feel comfortable or safe, you have a drink that looks like everybody else's drink. It doesn't look any different than a gin and tonic. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are some folks in the sobriety community that sort of bang a drum and are like, no, it must, you must tell everybody like, and be proud about this. My personal feeling is you've got to do what's right for you. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of ways that you can sort of protect your own safety if you're not ready to talk about it. So yeah, go up to the, the staff there, ask them to put stuff into a regular glass for you. And then you don't need to say anything to anybody. So I know you mentioned the underground. Are there bars in Vegas that are more sober friendly than others? And like, which ones? Um, I've honestly, and I've gone out to a fair amount of places with friends who are visiting. I mean, we know because we live in Vegas and probably a lot of the listeners know you get people coming through Vegas all the time. And when they come here, they want to go out. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think that five years ago, a lot of bars and restaurants didn't recognize the market with non-alcoholic drinkers, but they're starting to. And pretty much everywhere I've been in the past year has a mocktail menu, a non-alcoholic menu. I know I mentioned before Rebar. I find them to be really sober friendly. Esther's Kitchen, even places like Vanderpump has huh. a non like a mocktail menu. And then along Spring Mountain, there's so many great tea houses. You don't have to abstain from going out just because you're not drinking. Right. Even like classic places like Frankie's Tiki Room, they've made me like awesome mocktails before. So huh. yeah, like it's fantastic. So I would say you can always call ahead of time. You can always read the Yelp reviews. Like people are pretty good about posting pictures of menus, especially if you're a person like myself that gets a lot of anxiety about going out. You can kind of do your research ahead of time and make sure that it's going to be a place that you feel safe and you feel welcome. Mm -hmm. So I need to know like your top three favorite non-alcoholic things to order. When you go okay. Out. So Corey's Mediterranean at Sahara and Fort Apache has the best fresh mint lemonade Ooh. I think I've ever had. So highly recommend that. I also really recommend um, Lagunitas has a really good drink called Hop Water. You can get that like a lot of places have it on their menu. And then you can also buy it at places like Albertsons and Whole Foods. So yeah, the you Lagunitas just posted water. about that on your Insta. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like hops so that the stuff that makes beer, beerish, <laughs> hop, <laughs> hop water. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of places are also starting to to carry liquor stand-ins, like a non-alcoholic sort of whiskey substitute, non-alcoholic tequila substitute. A lot of the higher end bars on the strip are starting to carry things like that. And especially like the restaurants as well are experimenting. One brand that I know is pretty popular nowadays is called Seed Lip. So Seed Lip is like a non-alcoholic liquor substitute that a lot of people have used in their mixed mocktails as well. Okay. I'm excited because mint, mint water, like mint lemonades are my jam. So yeah, Corey's. <laughs> <laughs> so in running your blog, Sober in Vegas, for about six to seven years, what's something you've learned about Las Vegas that's kind of surprising? I think that Las Vegas will cater to where the money is. So if you're <laughs> coming here and you're a non-drinker and you have money to spend, Vegas will notice that and has noticed that and will cater to you. So if there's something that you wish was here in Las Vegas and you're not seeing, my experience has been that put your, your dollars there and that will continue to grow. At least that's what I've seen with the sobriety offerings here in Vegas. Look, now we have a new slogan. Las Vegas will cater to you. Leave the tip. <laughs> Well, Kim Miller, I'm so grateful that I was able to see you and talk to you today. Thank you for being on CityCast Las Vegas. Thank you so much for having me, Vogue. Before you go, here's David with a little news. After a decade of rising, apartment rental rates actually went down at the end of last year. 
Not much, though, just 1%, so that probably won't be much comfort to the hundreds or thousands of Las Vegans who may face eviction once federal rent assistance starts winding down next week. Legal aid specialists are working on it, but they say they're seeing up to 300 people a day who are worried about losing their homes. Meanwhile, in more upbeat stuff, the big Lovers and Friends Fest doesn't take place in Las Vegas until May 6, but if you want to see those headliners, Missy Elliott, Mariah Carey, Usher, more, you'd best act now. Go to loversandfriendsfest.com to register for the ticket presale, which begins Friday. That's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend? Rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more booze. I mean news from around the city. Talk soon. Talk soon.